This is the Mind Body Detox Podcast, where we discuss all things integrative health and wellness, interviewing folks from all over the world, sharing insights and wisdom on how to live a healthier life in mind, body, and spirit. Welcome back to the Mind Body Detox Podcast. I'm your host, integrative intuitive medium, Kara Loveheart, and I'm very excited to introduce you to our special guest today. This has been a topic that's been really, really heavy on my heart to really start to bring it out into the world, especially um, in the times of 2020, we have so much um, around our survival and just money in general. I think that when we're looking to really improve our lives, Um, scarcity thinking and um, a negative money mindset can really hold us back. So I really am excited to introduce you to our special guest today. Her name is Michelle Leffler and she is my favorite Capricorn. She is super black and white and straight to the point. She's a straight shooter. She does not sugarcoat so she's going to be very strong with her message today which is really exciting. And she was really geeking me out. We were laughing a lot and uh, really covering this topic from a serious standpoint, but also just um, just some of the ridiculous things that come up when we have a scarcity mindset. And I also want to apologize about the quality of this episode. We did run into some um, connectivity issues. So I just, it, it's too good of information for me to just uh, trash it. So I wanted to just apologize up front that we have some of the in and out with her voice, but... Um, I promise you our upcoming episodes will not have that because I am grateful I have a new platform that will be helping me when I record my special guests. So thank you for bearing with me and enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. I am excited to talk about this topic today because it's been a topic that's been really not only a trigger for me, (laughs) but also uh, uh, caused a lot of healing and created a lot of amazing growth in my life. And I think this is a topic that a lot of us really do not look at deeply enough and we avoid. And the topic is money, not just money mindset, but all things money. And so I am joined here with my special guest, Michelle Leffler. She is a shamanic energy alchemist, owner of Living Moon Meditation. And I am excited to talk about this. We were actually meeting at a local class here in York, Pennsylvania, and we started talking about this topic about how pervasive poverty mindset sets, scarcity thinking, and all these issues around money in our local community have really held a lot of people back, created separation, created fear, jealousy, envy, all the horrible toxic things that it causes when we relate to and approach money from an unconscious or less aware perspective. So Miss Michelle, thank you so much for joining me. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive in here. How'd you get started with your business and what do you, what do you really offer in your business? First, thank you for um, having me be here on the podcast. I appreciate that. I've got started in my business after several years of doing intense soul work, personal work. I had a lot of things I was dealing with, a lot of loss, a lot of trauma. A lot of it revolved around 10 years ago when my husband at the time passed away. I was 31 years old. He was 24 and I came home from work one day and he was he had passed away in our bed and that was very traumatic to come home and find someone young in relatively good health had died. And so that just was the start of a spiral for me, not necessarily a spiral downward, but a spiral to find myself really. Um, I had been pretty much living my life based on what other people thought I should live my life like, how I should be, the things I should believe, the things I should do. And that really was the catalyst that put me on the path I'm on now. Obviously, it didn't happen overnight. It took quite a while. And 10 years later, here I am. So that's the basic gist of what got me to where I am today in 2021. The main things that create that spiritual awakening for us 
are what that near-death experience, having someone pass away and that grief of having to re-identify yourself. Bankruptcy is another one. (laughs) Divorce and and having a disease or an illness. So those yes. are those are really big <laughs> big ones. And so you had one of the big kahunas drop into your lap. I had actually as a teen, I had a near death experience, but that didn't put me on the path. That was <laughs> like your mini wake up call. That was your mini wake up at the time. So I think I was still in that mindset of nothing's gonna get me. And then later when I had the death experience with my husband, I was older and I was like, yeah, this is going to happen at some point. We all are going to go. So yeah, the difference between 17 and 31 (laughs) was a lot of life experience there that had something to do with it. But from there and where I'm at now with my business, I work with people who are dealing with self-love issues, who um, give too much of themselves without setting boundaries they take care of everyone and don't take care of themselves and they're on the path to burnout they know that but they don't know how to change it or people who um are dealing with spiritual issues because they don't know how to blend their if it's a traditional religion they come out of they don't know how to blend that with the spirituality or the woo that they believe And so that's what I do with my own practice. And so I work with people to help them with that. And then obviously with issues surrounding death and dying, I do death doula work as well with my clients. So people who are experiencing death of a loved one or getting ready to plan for their own passing, as we all will do at some time. So it's three different branches there all rolled into one that I tackle with my clients. And all of them relate to that transformation and that alchemy piece. So of course the shamanic energy alchemist is like the perfect name for what you're doing. So I love it. I love it. So I do too, but I'm kind of biased. (laughs) So Michelle, I want to back up to what you were saying about the clients you work with that are the, those one who are giving too much and who are in burnout because not just that population, but I think a large majority of that population does struggle with this topic we're going to dive into of money. And so, so first of all, you know, because those are the givers and like, Oh, I don't need anything for what I'm, you know, don't, you don't need to pay me. So there's so many facets of this money topic we're going to talk about, but I want to first talk about that genre of people that specifically Michelle you're working with, because I feel like this is also a large part of our audience who is listening, the givers, the nurturers, the healers, those out there that are, I don't really need to accept money for my work. So Michelle, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. First of all, you don't have to accept money for your work. That is totally 100% up to you as a practitioner or whatever. If you're comfortable not accepting money for your work and you can do it, by all means, go for it. But Money is energy. It is not this evil thing. People use it in an evil way sometimes, but that's like anything else. People use things in a negative way, but it doesn't make the thing negative itself. Money is energy. And anytime we do work, we need an energetic exchange. Money is one way to have that. Money is the energy that our society uses to live off of, whether that's the way it should be or not, whether we can make it different or not, that's where we're at now in society. And practitioners need money to live. It took money to learn the skills that we have. It takes money for us to pay our bills. We need money to feed ourselves. We need money to clothe ourselves. We need money to take care of ourselves in whatever way. And that is energy. When I come to a healer for whatever work, because I do see other healers, I am willing and able to pay them. If I don't have the money to pay them, I either work out a barter system with them or I don't go until I can. And I do what I can on my own because I respect that person's time, energy, and effort enough to give of myself. I can't expect to get something in exchange for nothing. And that's just the way it is. If you can live, if you can do healing work, and if you can work with clients 
and be able to meet your needs without having money as the energetic exchange. I'm all for that. Do it. It's a wonderful beautiful thing it allows you to reach a level of clientele that may not be able to afford I love what you're talking about so this they I agree with you completely really needed coaching that I was offering on um, a certain subject and she could not afford my services so I had her bake me a cake a vegan cake because I wanted it because I'm not eating gluten, I'm not eating dairy, whatever. So I needed something that I could eat and I wanted this cake, but I'm not going to go out and bake it myself because that's just not me. Money is a form of energy and energy exchange. And it's interesting because we definitely put value in different types of energy. So an energy exchange could be money. We could value that. It could be a trade. It could be time with other people. It could be you value more travel and more freedom in your life. So you're putting your energy, whether it's money or trying to barter or whatever it is to be able to travel, or maybe you have more value in staying at home, being a homebody and building your physical arsenal of things. You collect things. You like the creature comforts and all the, the latest gadgets or things like that. So I think it's interesting, this really good foundational viewpoint on money as just energy and that energy itself, whether it's money or any other form of currency, this current, this, this flow form, whether it's the form of money or whatever, that looking at it from a standpoint of what do you value? So the more you value something, whether it's money or not, that's where the value is placed in. And I think that this topic of money in our local area, um, specifically, is has had a lot of we've had a lot of trauma with that. So, from you, be, you grew up in North Carolina, so we are here in York, Pennsylvania. I am curious about the perspective of one coming from another area into the central South Central Pennsylvania area, and your experience with or perception of money trauma in our area and what was what has that been like for you from where you came from money trauma or a money wound is a an issue that a person has surrounding money whether it be receiving money feeling like money is never going to be in abundant supply there's never enough money whatever that negative outlook on money is it is considered a money wound or money trauma. And for a lot of people, it is one of two things. One, there's never going to be enough. I'm always going to be without a serious lack mindset. And that is a money wound. Another is political, which we don't tend to think of in terms, but it is political with a lot of people thinking that money should not be the currency that our society runs on. Whether or not I agree with that um, doesn't matter because, as I said a moment ago, that is what our currency is, what our society does run on at this time. And so if we ever change that is one thing, if we don't is another. But at this point in time, that's what our society runs on. And so taking what we run on now and using it to combat to where you, you want to go creates a negative aspect with where we are as people right now. We may think that money shouldn't be what makes the world go round, but it is. And if you live with the mindset that it shouldn't, then you tend to think negatively about people who try to get money or even yourself for trying to get money. But the fact of the matter is you have to have it. So <laughs> those are two major money wounds right there. There are, are plenty of others, but I, I could go on for days and days. Oh, yeah, this could be a whole series of <laughs> series of talks. Like there's such a deep time. Yeah. This is a, this is like, I think for people healing those wounds, this is like years and years and years of healing, unless you come from um, a space of not having that. So yeah, go ahead. Yes, exactly. So just looking at those two, okay, from where I was in, at in North Carolina, there was a money wound there. There is everywhere because it's part of humanity and because our society runs on it and we need it to survive, everybody everywhere has some sort of money wound. 
moving to South Central Pennsylvania, however, uh, was a huge wake up call because it, the money wound that is here is astronomical compared to where I came from. Everybody, it permeates everything and everybody that I encounter in this area. And that's sad to me on one hand because there's so much history here, but because of so much history here and the just the history that goes along with building a country and this area being the seat of the nation at one point, even temporarily, but being close to, to other areas, Philadelphia, whatever, you have this whole birth of a nation type thing that plays into that money wound. And so it does not surprise me that we have that here to such an extreme, but it is very sad to see at the same time. So tell me about your experiences, like some examples, because I'm on the edge of my seat here. You guys can't see me, but I'm like, see how I'm like leaning in. I'm like, oh, because I've lived here all my life. And so when you're inside of a bubble, you don't realize you're inside of that bubble. It's like the fish in water doesn't know it's in water. It's so fascinating to me. And this is part of healing from my perspective. Part of healing your money wound is getting so many different perspectives on money, leaving, getting outside the box, experiencing different people, whether they're, they have lower income than you or higher income you from than you to just see that honestly, in all of this money is a neutral, a neutral substance. It's the people and how right. they handle it, how they view it. And all those different stories and those different wounds or not having them make a completely different consciousness around money and how it flows or how it stays or how it doesn't come to them. So tell me about the examples um, or some of some examples of what you've experienced just talking to people or maybe their actions based around the wounds that are local to South Central Pennsylvania. One thing that I've noticed the most and has been the entire four years that I've been here, something that stuck out to me right away and still does is the drastic difference in people's money um, and comfort with money. You have two different subsets. You have people, wealthy people with a lot of money, and then you have poorer people who have no money or little money and there's virtually no in between <laughs> in this area it's one or the other and just the way they look at each other and interact with each other and I've seen this in other places as well but it is very prominent here because there is such a huge dichotomy and there's not much of a middle class in this area you have people who have a little bit of money or a lot of money who see neighbors or friends struggling, but they don't want to help or give. They don't want to, to be generous and free flowing with their money because they want to hoard it for themselves because of that wound that there's never going to be enough that it's going to run out. Whether it be somebody who has money and thinks that if they give it to someone, that one, they're enabling somebody who's just not trying or they're going to run out and then they won't have any or somebody who does have money and could help someone else but they are afraid that because they struggle that they'll then run out and struggle even more and won't have any so it all revolves around that lack that money is going to run out kind of mentality but money is an energy and energy can neither be created nor just nor destroyed it's there it just is. And the more you give, the more it comes back to you, whether you have it to begin with or don't have it. You know, I'm not telling somebody who literally can't pay their bills to go out and help your neighbor down the street who also can't pay their bills. You have to be smart with it. But if you have the ability to help somebody, and it's not going to mean that you can't pay your heat bill or you can't put food on your table, then help somebody because you're going to get it back in so many ways. Absolutely. So I'll tell you a quick story here about my family and their backgrounds. My grandfather was of the philosophy that if you have a penny in your pocket, that's a penny that you can give away. Right. So he, I know that my, my family was a brethren of background. They're very, very modest, of course, in the way that they live. Um, but what's really interesting is 
from the stories I've heard, the, even my grandparents were so, so generous. In their generosity, they became more wealthy and they became the haves in contrast to the have-nots. Right. And they were all about love, preaching love, let's serve people however we can. So it's interesting in my family lineage, we have this pattern of this history of sharing, of giving anything we have that we want to give. And if we have something to give, we're going to give it. And then of course, receiving in return. But what's really interesting in the land of haves and have nots, even if you're giving out of generosity, even if you're giving because you have something to give and you gain more in return, what's so fascinating is seeing this envy and jealousy grow and the envy and jealousy, the lack attack, I call it a lack attack. When you're in lack attack, you're in envy and you're in jealousy. And then your flow with currency or money or any sort of physical resources gets cut off. And it's interesting because the more you're envious and jealous of the people, whether they're corrupt or not, it's interesting to me if they were not, you would think, oh, they're good people, you know, because most of our issues around money a lot of times is corruption. Um, But some people can't even be happy for people who are wealthy or, or have more to give away and they're doing it out of the kindness of their heart and not hoarding it. So t- I'd be curious about that, um, Michelle. What are your what are your perceptions on that? Because that's part of my story currently, even even to this day. I'm going, huh? I guess I I guess I um, inherited it from from my family. It's in the lineage there. Yes, and I think that that is also something that is very endemic in South Central Pennsylvania is the jealousy and the greed and the and by greed, I mean of the people who are jealous, because these people in general, from what I've noticed with my interactions with people, are the ones who are jealous of someone else's have, whether it's perceived or in reality, they tend to, yes, be jealous of the person, but they tend to also have resources that they just hoard themselves. And I'm not talking about hoarding as far as not giving to others. They don't even let themselves benefit from the money that they have. You have they a huge just bank account it. and you're never going on vacations. You're yeah. never buying yourself yeah. anything. You're never really yeah, enjoying because, it. Because there may be a day that I need it and then I don't have it because I spent it on a vacation. Well, girl, let me tell you, if I have a little extra, I'm going on a vacation if I can because I need that break. And I just need to get away from time to time and I will give to somebody if I have the ability to, and if I need a vacation, I'm going to go on a vacation and next year, my financial situation is going to take care of itself next year. There are things I need right now, but you know what? I'm still going on vacation in a couple of weeks because I need it. And that that consciousness, you know, is so, so different in certain people who like yourself, who have experienced that death grief, knowing that life is short and that we need to take advantage of it, seize the day. And I think after COVID, you know, 2020, I think there has been a lot of shifts in that awareness of really wanting to really enjoy life, enjoy what you have. Um, But I really appreciate you, you sharing all that, especially your perspective with not coming from here and moving here. But I also want to point out that this stuff we're talking about here, yes, we're, we are talking about South Central Pennsylvania, but absolutely this can correlate to wherever you're listening. You know, it's not just this particular area and some areas are, are better than, better than others. But I think with diversity in, in the classes, there comes less of that. Um, but even though it it depends on where you're at, you could be living in a space where, um, it is equally across the board, different, different levels of classes, but, you know, really we're looking at it from a broad spectrum. There's the middle class is disappearing. So it creates more polarization. What else is polarized in the world right now? Right. Everything. So why not money and why not, why not wealth? So the, the point of, of our talk today is to really bring awareness, first of all, to what Michelle talked about as money trauma and to look at yourself of where you might be carrying some of this money trauma, looking at how you spend your money, how you hoard your money, how you give away your money, how you handle your money. How do you pay for things? Do you kind of like your eyes glaze over when you're putting, taking your credit card out and you're putting it into the, uh, the chip machine at the grocery store or wherever? Do you, do you have conscious awareness when you're spending 
or when you're spending, you're super hyper aware that you're like, you're calculating in your head and in a fearful way, there's a middle ground to that. And I'd like to give from our perspective, what that middle ground looks like, not operating from lack attack, but what it looks like and how to spend money. Tell me about your experience and your wisdom on that, Michelle, how we spend and receive. That's a healthy. How we spend and receive money is basically at the root of who we are as a people and what our values are as people. If we do have a lack attack, um, using your words there, or a lack mentality, then it shows that we are afraid and are fearful. But if we freely give to others, it shows that we value other humans and that we know that people are basically generous and will help us when it's our turn that we're in need. The things that we spend our money on show what we value. The things that we don't spend our money on show what we value and what we don't value. If we don't value ourselves, then we're not going to spend money on healing modalities or um, ways to make ourselves feel better and love ourselves. But if we do value ourselves, then we are going to spend money on that when we have it. Of course, in balance with other things. None of this should be taken as a do, do, do this, don't, don't, don't do that. It's all within balance. And that's my mantra in everything, balance. <laughs> everything is like a panda that's what i've told my students before everything is pandas in life it's all pandas black and white there's no all black there's no all white it takes both to make a panda so i love that everything balance even with money i completely agree and i think what i love to look at in, in my perspective as well is that there is no good or bad necessarily it's just, and there's Definitely. no right or wrong necessarily. It's just that I always say, if your goal is to head towards the sun, that's your target, but you're headed towards the moon, that in quotes is the quote unquote wrong way to go. You know, you, it, it's still, and even still though, that's subjective. It may not be the wrong way to go because it might lead you back around, you know? But I think that looking at how we spend without judgment and how other people spend you know, neutrality is the key to really creating anything, I think, in your life um, and money as well. So when we judge other people for what they're spending or how they're spending or they're not spending enough or they're not saving enough or they don't even have a job, like in general, how we judge other people and how yeah. they're moving currency through them, I think really does cut off or, or say make or break our own currency. Again, that word currency is energetic flow throughout our lives. So I love to see when someone is spending their money, say it's cash and they're somewhere at a restaurant and they, they open the cash out, they lay it out nice and you know flat and, and the way they carry it and hold it with just a reverence that's that's open and flowing. Here is the bill. Here's your 20. Here's mm -hmm. your 50 for our meal or whatever. And smiling instead of yeah. sometimes people, they hide it. They tuck it behind the receipt in the little waitresses or servers book that they have, or mm -hmm. they crumple it up, especially tips, tips. They crumple it up. Like it's a secret, you know, for massage therapists, sometimes <laughs> people will take it and they'll crumple it up in their hand and they'll like secretly pass it to you. You know, I think the way you, you're handling your physical cash and even your credit cards it really tells a lot mm -hmm. about yourself. And I can catch myself getting in lack attack mode. We all do. So I just continue to be it's very conscious nature. of how I'm carrying and holding that. And I love to be extra conscious when I'm paying bills um, and also paying my staff and employees. I love, I feel so grateful that I'm paying them because part of me is like, yes, we're doing this. I'm, we are providing money and income for other people as well as healing for our community. But when I have a bill too, it's the same thing. Oh my gosh, there's the gas bill. We got to pay that. But thank God we have gas now that we can keep this, you know, heated place so we can help people heal in the community and they come to a place right. to live. So I think how you spend money and how you earn money, and that was my other part, I didn't get to it yet, but how you spend money is really tells a lot about where you're at and your consciousness with it. How you earn money, that's a whole different story because I think it depends on where your boundaries are with that. So one of the things that I'd like to kind of segue into is we talked about spending. We talked about 
that, that lack attack and that. But let's talk about earning and making an income. And let's talk about capitalism. <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> capitalism, okay? Because the I political. think the political aspect of it, yeah, because especially in this podcast, we talk a lot about spiritual topics. We talk about holistic health and wellness. And there is a wonderful group of people out there, I'm included in the group, and probably you too, Michelle, that we love everything that feels good. We love the mm-hmm. feeling good stuff because that feels good. But we know that corruption in capitalistic structures has created this distaste about it in general. And so sometimes we associate those things, the corruption and capitalism together in a way that, that we say, oh, let's just throw the baby out the bathwater and it's all toxic. And I think that really limits income and sustainability, the word sustainability for not just people in the wonderful health and wellness field, but people in general. So what are your thoughts on capitalism versus even socialism um, here? Let's go into that. I think it's, again, these are uncomfortable topics, guys. They might create some triggers for you guys, but I think these are really important topics to touch on. I've I can't say that one system is better than the other. I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to even go there. There are aspects of capitalism that I love. There are aspects of capitalism that I hate. There are aspects of socialism that I love, and there are aspects of socialism that I hate. So I am not here. It's all pandas. Um, it's all pandas yeah, again. It's all pandas. It's all pandas. Um, I'm not here to say that one is better than the other, but we do live in a capitalist society. That is what we have. Like it, love it, hate it, despise it, whatever. That's where we're at now. And until we as a society, as a whole, changes that, that's where we are. I can want to change it. You can want to change it. Individuals can want to change it. But individuals can't change an entire society's economic standing. The whole society has to come together and do that. And until that happens, this is what we're with and we have to make the best of it. So limiting yourself because you hate capitalism is only hurting yourself (laughs) in the long run. Because whether or not you're making money, capitalism still exists and we're still a capitalist society. Um, bashing other practitioners because they charge for their services. And that's something that's happened to me here in central Pennsylvania, um, being attacked because I charge money for services. If you don't charge money for services, good for you. Have at it. I love you. Be blessed. I wish you all the best in your business, but my business can't exist and I can't live and I can't support myself and my family by not charging money. And so judging me for that is not changing the fact that we live in a capitalist society. All it does is put out negative energy from yourself and put negative energy on me for only doing the best that I can do to take care of my family and to help others. I need something in return for giving the energy that it takes to do shamanic work. It is soul-sucking, energetic, depleting work, and I need something in return. And what I need in return at this point in our society is money because that's what it takes to pay my bills. Point blank, end of story, that's what it takes to pay my bills. Love and light do not pay my bills. Love and light do not put food on my table. It takes Oh my Cold, God. hard cash. I can't eat love and light. I love it. you so much. I love it so much. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's a really, really, really good awareness piece because I think you're right. Like everything's pandas. I love it. It is not black and white. There are some people out there that have the capacity to give their services for free because they have either a husband or someone that's taking care of them or a wife that's taking care of them. Cause that's also happening now. Or yes. 
they have maybe a trust fund or they have something to sustain their life and they're able to be of service and their purpose to be able to service of people who can't and afford to hire. Bless them. I love them right? and their ability and We to need that. that dynamic. And I think also it doesn't, you know, people who have the ability to afford and to exchange this flow of currency and they see value in what you have to offer, Michelle, or what anyone has to offer. I think it's a beautiful thing that we have all these different, all you can eat buffet, buffet ways, all you can eat buffet ways of exchanging and exchanging goods and services and things like that. I just think it's amazing. And, and it goes back to the, the point of, we there's room here for all of us as practitioners we can't have too many of us because if somebody can't afford my services or your services then they can go to the person who doesn't have to charge because they have another way to meet their family's financial needs and so we can be doing the exact same service in the exact same way and reach a buttload more people than any one of us could do alone. So I think that's beautiful too, but it does. It takes people who charge money and people who don't charge money. But what gets me the most out of all this is the ones that are the judgmental people about it who criticize me and other healers for charging money because we're causing trauma, yet they sell products that they sell for cash for money. And I'm like, isn't that the same thing? If you're going out in the wherever and you're digging up crystals out of the earth and then you sell them for money, how is that different than me? Mm. If you're growing herbs in your backyard and you pick these herbs off of a bush and then you make a tincture or whatever and you sell it for money, how is that any different than me? It's not. It's the same thing. It's still money. And I've had that happen with people and I'm like, until you give me your product for free, then don't talk to me about charging money for my services because it's the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there's, there's that energy that goes into it. The energy is getting trans transformed into a dollar or um, now cryptocurrencies if people are taking those. So there's so many different ways to do it now, which is so fun. And of course, barter too, but I completely agree with you. You have this, um, energy exchange. You're putting energy to making a product, to growing growing the plant, to cutting it up, to bottling it, to labeling it, to marketing it, to all the things you do. And then of course, as a shamanic practitioner, there's so much energy that goes in that honestly, if until you do that type of work, some people don't understand why people charge so much when they are a shamanic practitioner, if they need to for their mode of operation. Again, there's people that can do it without that. Um, it's something that is an interesting perspective because you are processing a lot of emotional and spiritual energy that unless you're an energy sensitive, you may not understand, but I think maybe a good, um, here's a good analogy for it. You can go to work for a dollar an hour job, what, 12, 14, 16, $20 an hour. And maybe you're a landscaper or you do a lot of physical tiring, you know, and it's, it's physically exhausting. Um, mm-hmm. That's one thing, you know, cause your body takes the toll. So you're exchanging value that way. You're putting out energy and you're getting it back in a different form. And as an energy practitioner, it's almost like if you are working with a really heavy case, if you're not able to re, establish your energy balance immediately after the session, it can be a little bit draining depending on your energy management skills. And that develops as a, you're a practitioner. It's almost like being right. in a heavy metal or I don't know, like a concert of some sort, like a, like a concert where there's a lot of stimulation, you're absorbing mm-hmm. sights and sounds and all that stuff. And you have fun doing it. Right. But then you come home, you're like, yeah. I am emotionally, energetically exhausted from all that work. So I think that's an interesting perspective, um, as well as the perspective that for energy workers, as well as massage therapists, I think some people always wonder why the services are at least $60 an hour. Um, People get into that field of work because they think, oh my gosh, I can make $60 an hour. But when you actually do do the math, um, you are considering, and I know, Michelle, you know this, you're considering Mm -hmm. you deduct your own taxes from that as 
not having an employer if you're self-employed. You also have sometimes have rent and supplies and marketing expenses. You have an accountant you hire. There's a lot of expenses that come out of that, that an average person who charges like $75 for an hour service, they really only make about $25 per service or $20 Mm -hmm. per service. And it's an interesting perspective because some people go, well, why, why should I tip that person? Why do they want tips when they're already charging like $75 or whatever? Um, And I think it's interesting because if you could work at at $25 an hour, 40 hours a week, that's a living. People do that. But energy healers, massage therapists do not see 40 people a week. They would no. die. They're mas- some <laughs> exactly. therapists who are athletic can do it, but it actually, you have, you can't do 40 a week because you have to have time in between. And it doesn't actually work out to do that for all people, for most people. So I think people re- don't realize that when you get down to it, you're probably making about $20 an hour, but you're not working 40 hours a week. So those tips and the, all the other things um, really do play a part. And I think it's a perspective to share because I think people don't really understand that at the end of the day. And I can't speak to it from body work side, like massage therapy and things like that. But for what I do with my shamanic work, it takes me time before a session to get set up, to get everything that I need to clear my own energy, to clear the energy of the room that I'm working in and get everything set up so that I'm a clear channel. And then I do the work for however long it takes. Generally, I book a session with a client for two hours. Not that we're working for two hours because usually it's less than an hour. But the rest of that time after our session is over is for me to detox the energy and to get my equilibrium back. And it does take that long, minimum of that long. And so I will book a two hour session knowing I'm only going to be working with the client for half an hour to 45 minutes, depending on what our session is. It could go longer than that, but generally it doesn't because the client can't take it much longer than that either. Not just me, but the client can't because they get overloaded energetically and they need to detox. So I booked this long 120 minute session knowing that it's about 45 minutes max But then I have to have that time to clear up the space energetically, physically, and myself, and to get ready for the next person if I have a next person right after. So it's, you may be paying for an hour service, but it takes two, three, four hours of my time. So when I book a two hour session, you're not paying for two hours. I have a flat rate. It's not, my rates are not per hour. It's per session and usually they're packaged together in a package of x number of sessions for this amount depending on what we determine at your intake session so we have all this so you're not paying like 60 dollars an hour times two hours 120 dollars, and i'm only giving you 30 minutes and then you feel cheated you're paying a set rate you get your session but i'm taking three four hours of my time for that session and that's why my rates are what they are because I know what it takes for me to do it. And are there other practitioners who charge less than I do? Sure. But I can't speak to the quality that you're getting from them. Not saying that you're not, but I'm just saying, I don't know what level of themselves they pour into the work, but I do know what level of myself that I pour into my work. And it's a lot. And I am holding space for my clients. And it just, it doesn't turn off when our session ends to be turned back on like the flip of a switch at our next session. I'm holding space for you the whole time we're working together. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My energetic level is put into you, plugged in. And I know you're getting that from me. But it's going to cost you something because it depletes me. And I have to live. I think it's really interesting to really look at the aspect of what you said there of just understanding all that goes into the work that you do. I think it's, it's beautiful because you don't really understand that until you've gone through training or you actually are a holistic practitioner of some sort, you does some sort of energy medicine therapy service. Um, so I think it's really good perspective for people who are in the audience that maybe just get services. They're not a practitioner of any sort. Um, but also I think it's interesting with this concept of the free market 
it's there is a lot of freedom and a lot of choices and opportunity for people who can afford a specific type of service. It's almost like all you can eat buffet again of like, well, you could go to someone on the street. Their quality may be just as good, but it may be a lot less. And I think that's one thing that we think, well, if it's only $30 and not 75, it maybe it's not as good. That's actually not the case, folks. I met a, um, a therapist that's a massage therapist. She's been doing it for about 20 years. She's amazing. Her and her husband are amazing. They're still charging $65 an hour, even though going rate, I think, is around $75 um, for the local area. And that's just what they charge. And it's not anything wrong. It's not good. It's not bad. But it's something that that's just how they're placing value on themselves. Now, again, this goes back to this perception of value. Like, I perceive her worth and how good she is at what she does especially trying a lot of different massage therapists out. I'm like, wow, I would pay $120 an hour to see her because she's that good. So, but she doesn't see herself. I told her, hey, you really, you know, and that's that's, okay. And that's one of two things. And what made me say this is you said that's how she sees herself. It's either A, she has the ability to charge way less. And so she wants to pass that on to people who can't afford higher price services. God love her. God bless her. Hope she does well. Or it's a money wound and she doesn't value herself and her service at a high enough price. I'm not saying that's the case. I can't because I don't know anything about her, but it's one of those two. Right. And that brings us to the next topic, exactly segueing what we were going to talk about is deserving and worthiness. But first, just kind of to, to cycle back through that free market, this ability to have, there's no one dictating for whatever service you do. You cannot charge more than, you know, within a $5 amount of each other. You have to charge the same amount because in other places, that's how it is. That's how things are set Mm -hmm. up in the monetary system. So it's really nice that we have a lot more freedom with your particular budget and your particular needs. You can find just a quality practitioner or a service or a plumber or whatever it is you need Mm -hmm. at a rate that will work for you. And with Facebook Marketplace now, look at that. There's so many opportunities to find, you know, as a single mom, like that was one of the things for me before, you know, I had enough to be like, oh, I can go buy this if I want to. It was like, oh, wait, I need this. Oh, wait, there it is on Facebook Marketplace, like only 10 yeah. bucks versus it's $60 retail. So it's, I feel like we <laughs> have some addicted to Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> He's on there all the time. <laughs> right. But I think that's part of also that money mindset of, moving from poverty consciousness or scarcity mindset into abundance is like seeing the abundance of opportunities for resources to come into your lap, that it doesn't always happen with money. It can happen with barter. It can happen with it being a gift, but there's so many different ways for resources to come to you. And I think deserving and worthiness are really foundational for any of them, whether it's money or not. And before we segue into the deserving and worthiness, I will say just one example, a pretty big example for when we started Firefly Hollow and we bought the property, there were potholes in the road the size of the Grand Canyon. And it would be very dangerous to have people walking maybe at night back to their cars in the parking lot after a massage and being relaxed and falling into the holes and hurting themselves. So it was a big deal. And I thought, (laughs) how are we going to pay for a new road to pave a new road? So of course the scarcity mindset, the lack attack goes, Oh my God, that's like $30,000 or more to pave a road. I mean, just paving a parking lot, like your, your driveway is like 10 grand. So we're like a whole parking lot and this whole road, how are we going to do it? So I don't know if you had moved here yet, Michelle, but we put it out there. I was like, look, this has just got to happen. If we're going to help people, if we're meant to help people, the resources will come along. We'll continue to save for it, but we'll find some way to make it happen. About a week later, we got a knock at the door from the Columbia Gas Company. Hey, we have to like dig up your road and put in new gas lines for you and the whole park around here. And we need you to sign this paperwork so that we can do that. But once we dig up the road and put in these new pipelines for your gas, we're going to repave it. So don't worry. (laughs) That's beautiful. That was before my time, but that is beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, it was back in like 20... 
2013 or 2014 that happened. Yes, 2017 so, but, when I moved here, so that was before my time. But that is beautiful. Yeah, it just goes to show that the energy can flow from anywhere. Because who would have thought the gas company is going to pay to pave this road? Well, there Absolutely. you go. They do. <laughs> I mean, that goes into the topic of law of attraction and all that stuff. Like that's a big thing. I'm very, very, very skilled at that. I say I'm very skilled at that law of attraction. And I think it's something that can be learned. But again, that's also relating to the, the deserving and worthiness. Because if I didn't feel that I, you know, we deserve to have this, not in an entitled way, but we deserve to have this because we're going to help people. And we are worthy of helping people. We are worthy of these resources coming. So I'd like you to touch briefly on that uh, deserving and worthiness and how that really can help or hinder our money consciousness. Self-love is the key there. If you don't love yourself, then you're not going to think that you're worthy of receiving and having your basic needs met. And if you do love yourself, then you inherently see the value and the worth in your being and in your ability to make your ends meet every month and have some left over. And that's, that's basically what it's about is self-love. But it does. It's an energetic thing there in that. And it, it works that way because people who struggle with self-love often don't attract abundance to themselves because of that energy. You're vibrating at one energy level and the energy of money is going to be attracted to itself and scarcity is going to be attracted to itself. So abundance has a high vibrational energy as does self-love self-hate or lack of self-love is a low vibrational energy as is poverty and lack so low vibration matches with low vibration and high vibration matches with high vibration and you can't sit here and be at a frequency super high frequency and attract low frequency energy of lack it doesn't work that way physics tells us differently and it's basically science everything is science here um you can't necessarily go and read in a science textbook about the law of attraction but it's the same thing it's physics and you can't be vibrating at an energetic level of lack and attract abundance because the high vibration of abundance is not going to be attracted to the low vibration of lack. It doesn't work that way. So it's all physics, it's all energy, and it's all self-love or lack of self-love. So love or fear is always the foundation for everything. And what Michelle said, that worthiness is really the more, you know, in every choice, are you loving yourself? And the more you can do that, the more you gain that self-love, that self-esteem, that worthiness, that deserving. And if you don't believe in the law of attraction, just look around. Because it is, maybe it's something that people are skeptical about, but at the same time, you, if you look enough, if you watch people enough and watch your own self, you'll find there are people that no matter what happens, they just bounce back. They lose something. Oh my God, they got a windfall again. How come they're so lucky? We just, we, we, we really write it off as some sort of, um, supernatural or not supernatural. Like, um, they're just lucky or we write it off as that. And there is something about those people's personalities tend to be more optimistic, tend to be more positive. They tend to be in more higher vibration, like Michelle said. So I think that those are really big places to start. Looking at how you're spending your money. Are you letting that cash fly free, open? It's, it's out there waving at everybody and saying, yes, I give you money, my waitress or server or cashier. And how are you receiving money? So this, this podcast has so many different layers. We have so many more topics that we could go into. We really did have a whole bunch, like a much more longer bullet points to kind of touch on, but we'll have to touch back on that. But I want to just move forward with the final questions of the show. And these are my rapid fire questions, Michelle, that I ask all of my guests. Um, so we're going to start with them and give me your quick answers. All right. <laughs> What are you completely obsessed with right now in the world of wellness? Money <laughs> is yes. what I'm obsessed with right now. <laughs> yes. Money, because it takes money to make the world go around. And I know there are a lot of people that are going to listen to this and cringe at the fact that I just said that, but hopefully that number is a little less now that we've talked about this, but that is what I'm 
on fire for right now and about right now is money and practitioners and healers having the money that they need and that they're worth. If you have all the resources that you need and all the healers and helpers out there that are heart centered, that want to give, can you imagine the world, the way the world would be? So if all of us can get rid of those money wounds and really allow ourselves to have the money and the resources that we need, what would the world be like? So I think it is valid to really, um, what Michelle's talked about, get passionate about it too, because I completely agree, Michelle. I think I completely agree. It's something that's not really touched on in the world of wellness. And I think it's up and coming. I really do. I think it's up and coming. Um, my astrology senses and my psychic senses says, yes, it is it here. It is. It'll be the thing that, you know, five years from now, like everywhere, you know, what was it? Like Reiki was the thing. And like, it's going to be a thing. Like it's going to be a thing. It's going to be money. <laughs> and we're gonna look back and be like, were we really all dealing with a huge money wound? Wow. Glad we're past that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Second question, if you could add or detox something in the world right now, what would it be? Again, money and the the way we look at it, that's what needs to be detoxed is the way we look at money. And yeah, I'm just going to stop there. No, I completely, 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 completely agree. And I I honestly, working with practitioners for the last 10 years, helping holistic practitioners be successful in their business, helping practitioners fill their books, the biggest block is worthiness, deserving, and money. Specifically money. We'd have people that get, even they'd get really successful and they'd be scared of the success and sabotage. So I completely, Mm -hmm. completely agree, especially in the world of wellness, again, what we could we do if we had everything uh, resourced and fully supported for us, what would happen? I yeah. can't wait to see that. Well, Michelle has some tools and resources for us. So I'm going to share just a couple of resources for people to go to. And I want you to end our show today with the amazing resource you have. Cause again, there are many, all you can eat buffet is it's, it's, it's pandas. Like Michelle said, it's not black and white. There's not one option. There's so many options and it's about what resonates with you. So one of the people I really highly recommend to get into, if you're really looking to connect with your wealth consciousness and really change um, your awareness of that is Keller, Caroline Elliott. She's an amazing author and has a program that she runs online. I think that Leah Steele, the wealth witch is also a really great resource. She's a little fiery. So if you like a fiery personality, non-apologetic personality, she's one of those. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill is a staple read if you have not read that book. I think it's a very, very good book. Um, It's about the law of attraction, but also relates mostly around money to start. And then I think just in general, understanding the the nuts and bolts and the black and white physicality of how money works as well, how stocks work and how things, just how things work. Cause we can understand the conceptualized things, but when you want to understand how to work the system, mm-hmm. um, Tony Robbins book, money master the game is another really good resource to check out. And again, there are so many other resources I would look up just Google wealth consciousness, money mindset. There's so many people out there, but those are the ones I usually recommend people to start with. And Michelle's got an amazing offering coming up. So tell us more about your resources that you have to offer. I want to second Carolyn Elliott because she is phenomenal. So check her out. She has um, her website, carolyngraceelliott.com. That's C-A-R-O-L-Y-N-G-R-A-C-E-E-L-L-I-O-T-T.com. That's a plug for somebody that I admire, not myself. Um, I also suggest that you do some Google research for money wound and the mother wound and see what comes up because that's often tied in with our um, early life and our childhood traumas that go with that often have a lot to do with our money trauma and money wound. And I have a program coming up in early October. It is called Flow, A Yoga Nidra Journey to Heal the Money Wound, and it's going to be a multi-week, multi-length yoga nidra recording each week for the length of the program, helping to detox the money wound and provide the medicine needed to heal that wound so that we can attract abundance and flow with the energy of money. So check that out coming up 
in early October, you can find information on my website, livingmoonmeditation.com. I will put all of that information in the show notes for direct links and all of that. And again, October, 2021, because if you're listening to this in the future, but that may be a evergreen um, offering that it may be available. Be evergreen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else you want to share today, Michelle, before we skedaddle? Just love is, um, is what I want to say. Just open up to love, flow with it give it, receive it, heal your own self, love yourself, and open up to the flow of money because we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. I hope you guys are in the flow. Check out Michelle Leffler's program, Living Moon Meditation, Flow, A Yoga Nidra Journey to Mastering Money, correct? Was it the right title? To Heal the Money Wound. Heal the Money Wound. I'm sorry. Yes, we'll have that. That's okay. But you guys definitely uh, check that out and we wish you well until we see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Mind Body Detox podcast. We wish you wellness and health in your mind, body, and spirit. And be well until next time, my friends.